Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, the biggest news for me this week has been the discovery of the first impact crater in Greenland, a place which is actually very hard to find craters in on account of it being covered in ice. I don't know why it's called Greenland when Iceland would have been a far more appropriate name, but never mind. Yeah, so Greenland, as I said, is covered in this big thick ice sheet and the crater in question is about 31 kilometers wide, 300 and something meters deep. And the way it was found was using ground penetra or ice penetrating radar. Now, uh, there was something called the Ice Bridge Project, which was essentially to bridge the data between ISAT-1 and ISAT-2. ISAT-2 was the launch that I went to see where uh, my car broke down. But yeah, um, they found circular structure of this size. Now, just because you find a circular structure with a depression and raised walls and a central peak, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily an impact crater. So the geologists went out to the area and they started collecting samples. And what's happened, what this is, is this is at the edge of a glacier, right? So the ice is flowing out and then it enters this big circular depression. And then out of this, you get meltwater flowing. So there's a river that comes out from underneath this where the ice is essentially melting. And so they took samples from this and what they found, well, they found, you know, sand, they found um, glasses, which could have come from impacts and they found, you know, metal uh, enrichment, which could indicate that it was a nickel alloy, metal, uh, sorry, iron, nickel, nickel iron asteroid. But the most, the real thing that really made the case that this was an impact crater was the fact that they found something, they found shocked quartz. Now, shocked quartz is essentially a metamorphosized form of crystalline quartz. It's been hit very hard by a shock wave without raising its temperature. And this, cre this distorts the crystal structure and it creates these linear lines in it. I believe the minerals are called coesite and stishovite. They were, um, you know, Eugene Shoemaker found these in nuclear blast, uh, nuclear craters. So uh, he then, of course, hypothesized that impact craters could uh, would include this, and he found them at a meteor crater in Arizona, and that was, of course, one of the best preserved meteorite craters in the world. Anyway, finding this is pretty much, you know, the smoking gun to show that this is almost certainly an impact crater. The question then is, when did it happen? How long has it been there? Well, it's an evolved crater, right? Normally when the impact happens, it creates a very deep and very narrow crater. And then over time, it kind of collapses in on itself. And then of course, the glaciers will erode it down. So for a 31 kilometer wide crater, you would expect that its initial diameter would be more like 20 kilometers, seven kilometers deep. And to generate that, the amount of energy would be something like three times 10 to the 21 joules. That is roughly uh, 750 gigatons, which is kind of insane. Uh, obviously gigaton being a thousand megatons. And, there aren't that many nuclear weapons in the world right now. But yeah, if that was a, you know, your typical near Earth asteroid, it would be something like 1.5 kilometers across, uh, assuming that it was made mostly of iron. One of the problems with the impact hypothesis is that there are, is no evidence of an ejector sheet anywhere nearby. Uh, and there's a number of possible explanations. One is that this impacted at an angle and it blew most of the ejecta out sideways over into this kind of to the southeast because this is on the northwest side of the the glacier. So it could be that yes, there are ejecta, but we just don't see it because it's uh, covered by other ice. Alternatively, since you know the Earth pretty much from twelve thousand years ago prior was covered in ice a lot more, it could have actually impacted into a very thick ice sheet. I mean, this is already under a kilometer of ice. So if you had slightly thicker ice, it would of course blasted that out and then made this big hole, but you wouldn't have had the ejecta, you wouldn't have had the glade, you wouldn't have had the surface being flipped over and producing these inverse sedimentary um, rocks like you'd see at Meteor Crater. So that would have mean that you wouldn't have had the same kind of ejector sheet. So that could be 
uh, an explanation. There's a whole lot of other evidence that suggests that this very likely happened during the, the Big Ice Age, although it could be as young as 12,000 years old which is actually a very interesting number and has led to a lot of people jumping onto something called the, the Lower Dryas Impact Hypothesis. So Lower Impact, lo, sorry, the Dryas, Lower, lower Dryas, it basically it comes from pollen that's a marker for a change in the weather, which was associated with a brief dip in the temperatures. Actually, it wasn't so brief, it was about a thousand years. But you know, going back to something like 2.5 million years ago, the Earth entered this period which we generally know as, know as the Ice Age. Uh, on some time, on, on large timescales, the Earth's climate is frequently driven by something called Milankovitch cycles, which is essentially the variations in the Earth's orbit. And it caused this period where there was essentially lots of, consistently lots of ice ages, and we were pulling out of this ice age about uh, 12,000 years ago when suddenly it flipped back and we jumped straight into an ice age very, very quickly. And then, of course, we recovered and modern, you know, human, human civilization really started to take off around then. Although, you know, there was civilization, the very first agriculture, in fact, the very first beer making was happening around 13,000 years ago down, uh, you know, in the, the where the Middle East is right now. So, the you know, the fact that, yes, it could have happened around then, the, the lower driest impact hypothesis said that, well, this is because of a, an impact. And, well, yes, that's possible. There's a lot of supporting evidence they throw around related to, like, nano diamonds and... Uh, you know, blackened areas. I'm not convinced at all because the evidence has actually been refuted in more than one case. Uh, and the fact that it's their, their impact would have had to be in North America rather than Greenland points to the fact that this is probably not that smoking gun, although many people will claim that it is. Uh, having said that, you know, it's definitely very, very young because although it has been eroded down, uh, we normally a 31 kilometer, you know, crater would be about 700 to 800 meters deep. It's been eroded down to about 300 meters deep. Um, that is still exceptionally well preserved when you consider that this object, this uh, crater, has been sitting under ice. So, it's not entirely unreasonable to think that this crater could actually be younger than the best preserved impact crater in the world. That is the Barringer Crater in Arizona, also known as Meteor Crater. That is much smaller. It's about one kilometer across. It's 50,000 years old. And I, of course, had the you know, rare privilege to walk down, hike down into that thing, and it is absolutely stupendous to see the crater walls rising steeply around you. But this thing obviously is on a much larger scale and is covered by ice right now and will be for quite a while still. Yeah, the paper's really interesting. I have kind of barely scratched on it. So, yeah, watch this space. Maybe we will get some better analysis. Obviously, now that there's some uh, evidence there's going to be some pressure or there's going to be better arguments for going out and getting some of the stuff, getting, you know, collecting samples, collecting other details which might give us a better example, better idea of the geology that is making this, uh, shaping this. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.